growing up just from our uncles and from the people in our family we never learned it from the hadith and so being a scriptural community let's just learn exactly what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was telling us to do straight from his mouth that we don't have to get confused about this alam and this school and that and what they said and why we're different and we just uh, you know uh, follow the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so there's this book it's called Taysir al-Alam fi Shah Umdatul Ahkam. It's a book that has taken uh, the fiqh from the hadith. Uh, and it takes it only from Bukhari and Muslim. So everything that Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim have to offer in terms of what we do in our worship, ibadah, he has gathered it and made a commentary on all of the hadiths uh, there. And so um, he begins his his collection with which hadith? Hmm? Majid, you know? Which, which, what do we begin with? <laughs> yes. Everything starts with intention. All of everything in terms of actions of servants of God begin and end with your intention. If you're not intending seeking Allah's pleasure and His contentment and being His servant and doing His will and you're doing it for any other reason, then it doesn't matter what you do, no matter how Islamic it looks, no matter how many hadiths tell you to do it. If it's not for that reason, then it's invalid. So we don't have to go back through that hadith. We memorize it, inshallah. The first hadith in the Tahara, he puts is, an Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la yaqbalu allahu salata ahadikum idha ahdatha hatta yatawadda. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the people, that Allah would not accept any one of your prayers if you have uh, in, uh, introduced something, I'm liter literal hadith for you, um, until you make um, your ablution, the ritual washing uh, of a spiritual meaning. So in Arabic when you say ahdatha, it doesn't really um, literally mean that. So what did all the scholars understand from this? There's a consensus of the Muslim scholarship. What does ahdatha mean? It means either to, they say al kharij min as right? So either you uh, um, urinate or you use, uh, you defecate, number two, or you pass gas, right? <coughs> so any one of these three, if you uh, have any one of these three things happen, then now you cannot pray unless you are making the ablution. Right? And so um, the Islamic uh, concept of wudu is saying, well, as a physical body, we take in things and our body naturally knows what's not good for us. Right? <clears throat> Isn't it? How does our body know what is good and what is not good for us? Does it? It does. You got, I'm telling you, if you study biology as a Muslim, just like for the sake of tafakkur. Wafi anfusikum afalatum surun. Subhanallah. Rabbil Izza. You will see a qayyumiyatullah fi khalqi. If you study it, you will see his, his order and specific uh, systems that he creates everything. So the body knows this is good and beneficial, we'll use it when you eat. And the body knows this is bad and harmful. It's not good for you. You can't keep it here. And it gets rid of it. Right? So similarly, you will collect deeds. Right? Some will be good for you. You want them to stay with you. Right? But you also need to be purified from the bad, the bad deeds. Right? So just as we are purifying our body from these bad deeds, <coughs> we are purifying our body from these bad foods and bad things we have eaten and drank. You see? So similarly, when we pray, we are looking to purify our souls. So there is a correlation between the two being made. You see? That's what it's about. And if you explain this to like a non-Muslim or an, a child of a Muslim who is in a critical thinking American mindset, as they get older, it will make sense to them. Now this will, oh, okay, now it makes sense. Other than that, it's like, man, I got to do that. And then you unfortunately get your eternal wudu. The wudu is like, yeah, Baba, I have wudu. From when? Since yesterday? <laughs> MashaAllah, 16 salah ago, and you still have wudu somehow. Yeah. 
And there is authentic hadith, it's not written here, but it's authentic hadith. And it says, Can the Prophet Sallallahu Salah? Just so we know that it is Sunnah. It is Sunnah. And so many of the scholars said that this was just a reminder as we had explained. It's a point of reminding you that as you have just now purified yourself, you know, because what is the, these gases are getting rid of the things that is not good for you and getting it out of your body. It's not good. If it stays in, what does it do? It hurts you when you have gases in there. And so your stomach cramp mostly for gas is what it is, right? And so alhamdulillah, Allah has created a system to get rid of this. So similarly, the salah is the system to get rid of your sins. He is promising you, if you will pray, I will forgive you all your sins and put you in Jannah, right? So that's the key, the miftah al-salah al-wudu. It is the key. You should, it, the salah is invalid without it. So this is the hadith uh, here. Uh, and then about wudu, we'll just read one more hadith here. And Abdullah bin Umar bin al-As radiallahu anhu wa Aisha wa kam min al-Sahaba qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam waylu lil-a'qabi min al-nar. Right? So beware of not properly washing your ankles and your heels uh, from the hellfire. So why? So the hadith sounds strange. It does. I mean, if you just read it, what is that about? Right? If you just read it, it's like, what is that? You see? Because he, did, he just says, Waylu lil min al-nar. It sounds like he's warning that uh, ankles and heels are going to the hellfire. That's what it sounds like. So you have to understand the context, siyaq al-hadith, in which situation that the Prophet saw Salaam says. It says he saw somebody washing their foot like this and then they just went. And they did not go all around here like this. Somebody has not gone like this when they made their wudu. Right? And so the Prophet وسلم, was warning that person. Not he trying to make them fear that Allah wants to destroy them. It is the seriousness of the act of worship that is wudu. This ablution uh, is a very serious act of worship. It should be treated like any other act of worship, inna Allah katab al-ihsan ala kulli shay. That we should do the best that we do and everything that we do. You know, the first time I saw this, I, I had been doing wudu wrong for the first year or so, year of, of my being Muslim. Because I read the thing, you know, I said do this, do that, and I was like, okay, you're supposed to do this, these are the rules. I had didn't understand it right. I was at the, um, we were at the lake having a barbecue. And they had one of those, you know, the old school water uh, pump things. And the brothers are all making wudu there. One brother, mashallah, he went around. He just said, asaba, takhleel al-asabi'ah, and kullish. Both of them went up all the way into the nose. Just like that. He says, mashallah, the brothers, you know, pow, pow. He's all serious, not everything, you know. Mashallah, he went between each of the toes and everything and around. And, you know, like that, you know. And I was like, mashallah, I was like, dang, you're serious. And he's like, this is the sunnah, why would you not? And I was like, I've never seen anybody do wudu. He said, this is the way the Prophet ﷺ was doing wudu. Why would he do any wudu any different way than that? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is, you know, alhamdulillah, the example of our Prophet ﷺ teaching us purity. Inna Allah yuhibbu al-tawwabin wa yuhibbu al-mutatahirin. He put those together. You see what I'm saying? He loved those that turned back to him, purifying themselves from their sins. Just like he loved those that purified themselves in this world um, from all of the impurities of this world. We ask Allah to make us of the pure and enter us into an eternity of pureness in the presence of the pure.